A very good afternoon and welcome and thank you for tuning in to this very special webcast um, today of all days on Shakespeare's birthday and of course on St George's Day which Shakespeare would have loved. Um, and we're coming to you live from the Tez offices in London. My name's Antona Tohan and I am from the Shakespeare Birthplace Trust in Stratford-upon-Avon where I am a lecturer in Shakespeare studies. And the Shakespeare Birthplace and Tez have collaborated to bring you this very special webcast, this, spe this session on Shakespeare, his language and poetry. So I'm going to be talking to you for the next sort of around 45 minutes and we're going to be thinking about two main things. We're going to be thinking about Shakespeare's language and why his language is so important and how he crafted that language for the stage. You see I'm standing next to a picture of the stage. And we're also going to be thinking about Shakespeare's verse, his poetry, how we identify verse within the plays themselves, the plays that you're looking at. And then what do we do once we've found that verse? What do we do with it? How do we engage with it? So language and poetry and the powers that be have provided you with a way of accessing um, the resources that I'll be referring to throughout this session. And you might have printed those out or perhaps you're consulting them on um, smartphones or tablet devices. And for those of you that have those, you'll notice that I'll be referring to a few plays throughout this session. I'll be referring to Romeo and Juliet, to Twelfth Night, to Love's Labour's Lost, and to As You Like It. Now, please don't worry, don't be anxious if you don't know those texts or you haven't read them, or even if you've read them all, it doesn't matter. The skills that we'll be learning um, throughout this session are applicable to all of Shakespeare's plays. So even if you're looking at Hamlet um, or Macbeth or King Lear, it doesn't matter, the skills are still pretty much the same. We can extrapolate them, take them away from this session and apply them um, to any of the plays. So as I said, I'll be talking to you for around 45 minutes, after which there'll be a 15 minute window. And that is your window of opportunity to get in touch with any questions or comments that you might have um, about Shakespeare, about his language, or even about this session. And to do that, all you have to do is email your questions to webchat at tez.co.uk so that's webchat at tez.co.uk or alternatively you can tweet um, your comments and or questions in at hashtag tes live that's hashtag tes live so do get um, get in touch with your questions um, anytime throughout the session and i'll try and answer those and we'll read them out your comments as well um, at the end of the session so, you'll notice that I'm standing next to this image here of an Elizabethan stage. Now, um, it is the interior, it's a sort of typical uh, Elizabethan outdoor theatre that would have existed in London. So this is a picture, a uh, very special picture, a contemporary drawing of the Swan Theatre from the 16th century. It's actually the only um, contemporary drawing that survives from this period of an Elizabethan stage. So we're very lucky to have this and from it we can infer a lot of things or kind of uh, learn a lot of things that we need to about the kind of space that Shakespeare was working with as an actor and as a playwright. So if we look at this image, or if you've printed it out or are looking at it alongside this session, then take a look at it and you'll see that we're in a sort of um, a rounded theatre, so a theatre in the round almost in the auditorium, and we have what we call a thrust stage. And that is very simply because the stage thrusts out into the audience. And the audience members... Um, could get into the theatre for as little as one penny. So if you had one penny spare in the afternoon, you could go along to see a play of William Shakespeare's, which would have been very, very exciting indeed. So if you paid a penny and had your basic penny entrance to an outdoor theatre, um, then you would be standing in what we call the pit. So the pit here at the bottom of the stage. And there, obviously your legs would get a bit numb after about three hours, but you'd be the closest, you'd be very, very close up to the actors, very close to the stage. It would be a little crowded and you'd probably have your pocket picked as well at the same time. Um, but there you are, you'd, you'd have a cheap entrance to the theatre. Now, if you were lucky enough 
to have a little bit more money to spend on frivolous entertainment, then perhaps you'd be able to afford a seat under the shelter around um, and the outside of the theatre. And if you had a little bit more money, you could even afford to hire a cushion so that your bottom doesn't get numb throughout the long production. But the most expensive th seats in this kind of theatre um, were really in two places. The first one would have been right at the back of the, of the stage, at the back here. You can see, just and if you can see a little bit, um, the seats at the top across the back of the stage. So essentially you're paying rather a lot of money to see the top of actors' heads. Um, and that would have been very, very expensive, as I said. And the other expensive place to sit would have been on the stage itself. So if you had plenty of money to spare, you could actually get a seat put onto the stage, especially for you. And obviously, if you had that kind of money, you wouldn't care about the other views that you're obscuring while you're sitting right on the stage with the actors. So it would have been very exciting. But there are two main reasons why these two spaces were the most expensive um, to sit on as a member of the audience. And the first reason is really quite obvious. If you are wealthy enough to be able to afford those seats, then you are probably wearing your finest um, clothing, perhaps your finest jewels and your, your best hat. And if you were wealthy enough to afford clothes and perhaps rich um, fabrics and colours, like crimson, for instance, then you'd want to be showing them off. And of course, if you could afford to sit right at the top of the stage, then everybody else in the theatre would be able to see you there. And of course, if you're sitting on the stage itself, then nobody can miss you at all. It's a perfect opportunity to have a sort of fashion show, in a sense. So that's really why those seats, um, partly why those seats were the most expensive. But the second reason is really what we're interested in today. It's to do with Shakespeare's language, with the language of the theatre in general. Now, in Shakespeare's day, audience members would never refer to the theatre as a visual experience. So people would never say, I'm going to see Romeo and Juliet, or I'm going to see Hamlet, I'm going to see Macbeth. They'd say something rather different. Now, we have clues about this um, from Shakespeare himself. So, for those of you that know the comedy A Midsummer Night's Dream, another middle comedy of Shakespeare's, for those of you that know that, you'll remember that at the end of the play, the Duke, the character of Duke Theseus, asks his serving man to bring him a list of entertainments that he can have at his, at his wedding um, ceremony afterwards at the kind of entertainment. And he says to his serving man, he points to a play called Pyramus and Thisbe, and he says to his serving man, I will hear that play. I will hear that play. So theatre in this period was what we call an aural experience, aural to do with hearing. It's all about language, it's about dialogue, it's about sounds. And not really much emphasis was placed on the visual world of theatre. So there weren't sort of huge elaborate sets and scenery. And there were, of course, props and costumes, but they were very economical with these things because, of course, they would have been very, very expensive. So the audience is learning everything that they need to know about place and character and action through language, through dialogue. And this is why so much emphasis is placed on Shakespeare's language, because it tells us everything that we need to know. It tells us about place, time, action. It tells us about mood. It sets tone and it creates, it provokes uh, feelings and emotions in us that enable us to connect with the scene as well as with the characters. So we have this very bare kind of stage here. And of course, if theatre is something that we're listening to, then no wonder the seats that are closest to the stage are the most expensive, because those are the seats in which you're not going to miss a single sound, a single word, a single key piece of information that the playwright has put there to give you, to explain more about the world that he's created in, um, in his piece of drama, in his play. So, in plays, for instance, like Hamlet, the very first words that you hear are, who's there? Who's there? Those two words open the play. That's because it's very dark, and all these characters are on edge. And you've got a character that says, um, "'Tis bitterly cold, tis bitter cold, and I am sick at heart.'" 
and they talk about it having struck 12, so we know that it's midnight. It's freezing cold. The characters aren't particularly happy about being where they are outside on the battlements of the castle of Elsinore, and they can't quite see who's where because it's really, really dark in the middle literally in the middle of the night. And again, it's just Shakespeare using language very effectively, very, very economically, so that he's not wasting words. But while he's using the words, he's giving you the information, the exact amount of information that you need to learn about the world that he's creating for you. And even when Shakespeare gets more poetical, I suppose, when he gets really sort of flouncy, because we often think that Shakespeare's a bit fussy in his language, um, which, you know, as I said, he doesn't waste words. And the reason he does that is, is very kind of, is very practical in a way. So, for instance, in the comedy um, The Merchant of Venice, for those of you that, that, that know that play, there is a wonderful moment when the character of Lorenzo is talking to his newly wed, um, his new, new bride rather, um, Jessica, and he says to Jessica that the floor of heaven is deep and laid with patterns of bright gold. And that's really beautiful, the floor of heaven is deep inlaid with patterns of bright gold. So what do you think he's actually talking about? What do you think Lorenzo is talking about patterns of bright gold? Really, he's talking about stars, and Shakespeare could very easily have had Lorenzo say, look, Jessica, the stars look pretty good this evening. But actually, the theatre, in reality, in the theatre, Lorenzo and Jessica, the actors playing them, because, of course, there were no female, there were no actresses on the stage, so it would have been an actor playing Jessica. The actors are in an open-air theatre at around 2 or 3 o'clock in the afternoon when the birds are singing and the sun is shining, or most likely it's raining and quite cloudy. So Shakespeare has to get his audience imagining this beautiful nighttime starlit scene um, and he's doing that using his language very beautifully, using this wonderful image, the floor of heaven. So it almost becomes like the sky becomes a sort of carpet or a tapestry that's deep inlaid with those patterns of bright gold. So this isn't flouncy. It's actually very, very um, deliberate, very calculated, so that you and the audience start imagining this beautiful, rich, luxurious nighttime sky, when in actual fact what you've got is probably a cloudy sky with a few birds flying over the top in the middle of London. So it's all very practical. It's all to get you imagining these scenes very, very vividly and vividly through language. And as I said, Shakespeare doesn't throw away any of his words at all. He's very good at using them economically. Now, one of the, one of the things that Shakespeare does very cleverly is to set tone to make sure that everybody's familiar and okay kind of settled in to the world that he's established in each of his plays. So when I said before that Hamlet begins with the character saying who's there so we know that this world is all about uncertainty okay just from those two words. So what we can do is we can apply that same test to most of Shakespeare's plays, in fact all of Shakespeare's plays and this is a little test that I like to call the vocab test or the vocabulary test and what we do to perform the vocab test is we take two scenes from any play and those two scenes are the very beginning and the very end of any play. So let's take a look. So if you've got your resources printed out, have a look at the opening, the prologue to Romeo and Juliet. So here it is here. I hope you can see it. Um, and the prologue to Romeo and Juliet is pretty special um, for a few reasons. The first main, re the main reason is because Shakespeare very, very rarely actually has prologues in his plays. There's only a handful of them, um, and they're usually histories, history plays, that have prologues to them. A character deliberately standing in front of the audience, that's you, and saying, right, this is what's going to happen in the play, this is what's coming. So there's a certain element of artifice, as something a little calculated about having a prologue to your play, um, and especially if that prologue is in verse, as it, as it is here. Um, very kind of strikingly so. But we're thinking right now about vocabulary and tone. And obviously Shakespeare's using his words very carefully to establish that mood, that tone. So if we look at this prologue here, and um, very famously it begins, two households, two households, not two lovers, two households, both alike 
in dignity in fair Verona where we lay our scene. Well, there we are. We have an important piece of information given to us in the second line of this play. In fair Verona. OK, we're in Verona. It's exotic. It's Italy. It's beautiful. It's Italian people. They all have Italian names. Romeo, um, Juliet or Julietta. OK, um, there, are, there are some characters that have very English names, but that's Shakespeare for you. So we're in fair Verona, uh, where we're laying our scene, and then we get these interesting um, words, these interesting bits of vocab coming out at us um, from this text. So from ancient grudge, OK, so the word grudge is cropping up in the third line. Um, break to new mutiny. Mutiny. What is mutiny? Have a think about what mutiny is. What does that mean? Mutiny is about rebellion, it's about discord, it's physically rebelling against any authority. For those of you that know this play well, you'll know that there's quite a lot of rebellion and a lot of kind of discord and, and fighting in this play, and certainly um, in the beginning of this play. So we've got grudge and we've got mutiny, not sounding particularly nice, uh, partic especially if we think about this play being set in fair Verona. Verona's beautiful and exotic, and yet we've got mutiny and grudges here already in the first few lines. We've also got civil blood makes civil hands unclean. So that's an interesting, really interesting line there. Civil blood. These families are, to all intents and purposes, alike in dignity. They're dignified, therefore civilised and civil, obviously. Civil, um, civil blood has other connotations as well. Um, makes civil hands unclean. So we've got these dignified families becoming unclean, um, which is a really troubling images as well, uh, image rather. If you think about uncleanliness, that is something um, that's dirty but not quite. It's unclean, it's sort of an absence of cleanliness. Um, that interesting use of un there is, is um, quite striking. Next line, from forth the fatal loins of these two foes. Fatal doesn't sound very good at all. And certainly the word foe, foes, um, has very, very negative connotations. But we've got that nice bit of alliteration there, fatal and foes. OK, fatal, foes, mutiny, grudge, unclean. Doesn't sound like a very nice fair Verona so far. A pair of star-crossed lovers take their life. It's very dramatic. Star-crossed lovers. It doesn't sound very nice at all. These lovers have their stars, their destinies crossed. Um, so, yes, they're destined to meet, but they're, all, they're also destined to suffer great tragedy. Their stars are effectively crossed and against them. They have misadventured, piteous overthrows. Piteous overthrows. The audience is, is invited to pity these characters, um, these star-crossed lovers, who do with their death bury their parents' strife. Death, the word death is appearing in this prologue, the opening words in this play. Again, this is coming back to this idea of tone. This is Shakespeare using vocabulary, mutiny, grudge, death, very, very effectively to create this sense of atmosphere, this sense of place and the kind of world that we're in. This is a world of discord, strife. So what is strife? Think about that. Think about the word strife what it really means. Why is Shakespeare using the word strife? Why doesn't he just use um, the word? Uh, maybe, maybe he's, why doesn't he use another word? So sort of like um, parents' um, unhappiness or discontent. Why strife? What does that really mean? The fearful passage of there, that's a lover's death marked love. Their love is marked out for death. There's nothing sadder than that. Their love is doomed from the beginning. And the continuance of their parents' rage, which but their children's end naught could remove. Every single line in this prologue seems to be getting more tragic. It's getting worse, OK? And what we have here is the rhetoric or the language of discord. This is a world where there is mutiny, there are grudges, there's strife and there's rage. Everybody's angry, everybody's fighting, and children, children, youths, are dying for love. 
it's not a world that Shakespeare's setting up as somewhere beautiful, as somewhere that really feels like fair Verona. It's more like unfair Verona, which is really interesting. So we have tone very, very strikingly set through vocabulary in this prologue that comes first, very first thing in this play. So what we do now is we apply the same vocabulary test to the very end of this play. So if we look at the final words that are spoken in Romeo and Juliet, um, they go something like this. The prince says, a glooming peace this morning with it brings. Well, that's interesting, a glooming peace. Remember, we started this play with mutiny, with strife and rage. This is rebellion. And now we've got peace. OK. A glooming piece, though. It's not a happy piece. It's, it's sort of overcast, in a way. A glooming piece this morning with it brings the sun. For sorrow will not show his head. OK, even the sun is too depressed by what's going on in this allegedly fair Verona. Go hence to have more talk of these sad things. So even if you don't know this play, you don't know what's happened in between, you're, you can infer or, or kind of learn from this ending that actually some pretty bad things have happened. We've had sad things happen, um, gloomy things happen, sorrowful uh, things happen. Never was their story a story of more woe. This whole play, this whole story Shakespeare is telling us in this final scene here is full of woe. It is full of that strife and that rage and it doesn't quite go away. What we end up with is something amounting to peace, what seems like a resolution, but actually is almost um, not worse, but certainly just depressing and unfulfilled and dissatisfying, OK? So we go from mutiny to sorrow to, to woe. And all you have to do um, to kind of work out the genre of a play, for instance, is to kind of look at that opening scene and the closing scene and check for the vocab. So do the vocab test to see um, how the play, how the play's tone shifts in a way. So that is, Romeo and Juliet obviously is a tragedy. Now, we can apply the same rules of the vocab test to comedy. So I'm going to do that now. I'm going to think about the comedy as you like it, which is um, a middle comedy from Shakespeare's career. Um, quite the self-conscious comedy, if you think about the title, as you like it. This comedy, this whole story, is exactly how you, the audience, um, will like it, will enjoy it. It will do exactly what you want it to do. So let's see what he actually means by that. Um, if you look at this extract here that begins, As I remember, Adam, it was upon this fashion bequeathed me by, my, by will, but a poor thousand crowns. OK, so this is the character of Orlando, who is speaking to his serving man, Adam. As I remember Adam, he addresses him directly by his name, because remember that um, Shakespeare is using his actors and language to tell the audience what's going on and who's who. So you've got a character on the stage saying, OK, Adam. So now the audience knows that this person standing next to the actor on the stage is supposed to be called Adam. OK, so this is little signals that Shakespeare's leaving you that are actually very, very subtle, but also very important as well. Although I wouldn't call that subtle. Perhaps it's, too, it's very obvious. So here we have Orlando. And Orlando is complaining. He's complaining rather a lot um, to poor old Adam about the fact that his brother Oliver, his elder brother Oliver, uh, has refused to give him um, the money that's been left to him by his father and refused um, to give Orlando a good education, the education that he deserves as a gentleman. Now, um, the way in which we can tell exactly how Orlando's feeling here is, like we did with Romeo and Juliet, apply the vocab test. So if we just go through this here, there are words um, that really stand out. So we've got my sadness. We know Orlando is sad. He talks about my sadness in the first few lines of this play. Uh, my brother Jake wears, or Jacques, um, uh, my brother Jacques, he keeps at school. So we know that he's also got another brother, a middle brother, who is allowed an education. So we've got resentment here, which is um, very striking at the beginning of this play. But he keeps me rustically at home. He keeps me rustically. So he keeps him in this sort of uncivilised, well, arguably or comparatively 
uncivilised way. He keeps me rustically at home. He keeps me here at home unkept. I am unkept. Okay, that's quite sad in a way. And actually, he, he, um, he talks about his keeping um, as not different from the stalling of an ox. Okay, so Orlando, this character here, is talking about the fact that he is kept almost like an animal, almost like the stalling of an ox. So we get the kind of, we've got this kind of countryside vocabulary here. We've got rustic, rustically, and the stalling of an ox. And he talks about horses, his horses are bred better, okay? And we have more reference to animals. And then we get this really interesting word, uh, which is the word dunghills. Um, I don't know that many of, other, many of Shakespeare's plays actually begin um, by using the word dunghills, um, but there we have it in As You Like It. Um, and it's certainly not a nice word, and it doesn't suggest very nice things either. But obviously, Orlando is relating to that, to sort of his world that his brother's created for him is sort of comparable to a dunghill in a way, which is pretty awful. Um, he talks about nothing, this nothing that he so plentifully gives me. And that's a horrible kind of paradox that's going on there. He gives me um, plentifully nothing, essentially. He gives me lots of nothings, which is horrible. It's this kind of absence of, of things, a real sort of fundamental absence, perhaps an absence of love as well. Um, we've got bars me. Sort of being barred from something means that you're not allowed to do it. You're kind of refused. Um, and he's not, he bars me the place of a brother. So he's almost refused the position of a uh, brother to Oliver, which is awful for Orlando because he's feeling that here. And he talks about grieving and it grieves me, Adam, he says. And like we have in Romeo and Juliet, we have the word mutiny. Um, the spirit of my father, which I think is, in, is within me, begins to mutiny against this servitude. So mutiny, again, rebellion, servitude that we have here. And I will no longer endure it. So these, these kind of um, really key moments that we have in this opening speech tell us a lot about the kind of person that Orlando is. He's kind of unsettled. He doesn't quite know where he is. He's just beginning to learn about himself. Um, and again, if we look at his vocab, sadness, rustic, unkept, dunghills, um, barring, mutiny, grieve, grieves and servitude, okay? This is the position that Orlando's in. And this is the tone that Shakespeare's establishing at the beginning of this comedy. So like we did with Romeo and Juliet, we're gonna apply the vocabulary test, the same logic to the end of this play. So remember, the tone of Romeo and Juliet started out with strife and mutiny and rage, and it ended with sorrow, um, with woe and sadness, OK? And we're starting, as you like it, with mutiny, with rustic, with sadness, um, with servitude, with grief, OK? We're starting out this play like that, with lots of grief and sadness and mutiny. And we end it in a very, very different fashion. Um, here we have a character called Jacques or Jacques, um, not the brother of Orlando, confusingly, but a rather melancholy chap who hangs around um, in the forest of Arden. And um, Jacques or Jacques says, you to your fo former honour I bequeath. OK, so now we've got the word honour. That seems very different to the kind of world that we were talking about at the very beginning of this play with all those dunghills. There didn't seem to be very much honour um, there. Your patience and your virtue well deserves it. Ah, we've had a huge shift in tone here. Patience, virtue and honour. These words have a very different, uh, different connotations to them than those dunghills and that servitude and all that grief Orlando was talking about at the beginning of this play. We've got uh, land and love and allies. Allies. That's a word that's completely missing from Romeo and Juliet. You to a long and well-deserved bed. So this is, these are characters that are deserving things, that are well-deserving. These aren't characters feeling shameful or woeful about what they've done, as they are in Romeo and Juliet, for instance. We've got the word pleasures here. We've got the word delights and rites. So we've got the idea of ritual and delight and it being delightful. And for those of you that know As You Like It, you'll know that it ends in a great big country dance. So it's all about people getting married and living happily ever after. So we can actually tell just by looking at the vocabulary in this final e extract here. 
um, the delights and the honour and the patience and the virtue and the true faith and the allies and the land and the love, all of these things are telling us this is a comedy, it's got a nice happy ending and there's a resolution, there isn't that woe and strife left over that we have at the beginning of this play, OK? Now, this is important because genre was obviously very, very crucial to Shakespeare. And as well as kind of being able to tell um, how, how a play ends, uh, it's useful to know that for Shakespeare, tragedy was always about individuals, about people. And again, the language is crucial here because right from the titles of the play, you can tell essentially what the play is going to be about, um, especially in a tragedy. So if you think about um, the titles of some tragedies, um, so we have Hamlet, Macbeth, King Lear, Coriolanus, Titus Andronicus, there's something really crucial about the titles of these tragedies that differs fundamentally to the titles of comedies. So the Comedies, for instance, As You Like It, The Comedy of Errors, Twelfth Night, Love's Labour's Lost, okay? They have very different kinds of titles, and the difference is that tragedies are named after their protagonist, after their main character, the character that has a tragic fundamental flaw. So Romeo and Juliet are very naive and rash and very young, so they experience that early death, horrible, horrific death as well. Um, but As You Like It, obviously, is not about individuals. They're named... Um, not after uh, key characters. So As You Like It, for instance, isn't called Rosalind, its main character. It's called As You Like It because it's about a group of people and shared experiences. And here lies the difference, really, between the resolution of a tragedy or the absence thereof and the resolution of a comedy because comedy is about people coming together. It's a linear journey towards... Um, towards the formation or the forming of a community. So this is why we start with Adam, with Adam and Orlando talking about um, uh, mutiny and grief and sadness and dunghills. And we end up, uh, through that linear journey, with marriages and virtue and faith and merit and land and love and allies because we have people coming together, friends and true communal groups here. This isn't people being torn apart as we have in Romeo and Juliet. So that is what I call the vocab test, just seeing the difference uh, between vocabulary in the opening and closing of any play. And you can go away and apply that very same logic, the very same test, to whatever text that you're studying in class. Um, and I recommend that you do that. It's a very fun thing to do. Um, but you can see the kind of shift in tone that Shakespeare is trying to achieve um, with, with his vocabulary. So this is kind of setting the tone for that very bare stage that I was talking about before. But let's think more carefully about, about language within the plays themselves and then identifying verse within the plays. So let's think about a passage from a play. And I want to start with the passage, very famous passage, um, from Romeo and Juliet. Um, when the lovers, Romeo and Juliet, first meet. And please don't be anxious if, you, if you're not familiar with this play. It, it doesn't matter, OK? So here we have Romeo and Juliet um, meeting. And this is the first time that they meet. So the first time that Romeo kind of goes up to Juliet and, you know, instead of saying, hi, uh, my name's Romeo, they don't do that. They have this great big long conversation that sort of essentially doesn't, I mean, it sort of, it makes sense, but in their own world. And we're going to do a similar thing to the vocab test and look for kind of clusters of vocabulary, um, like we did with the tone um, at the beginning and end of the plays. So Romeo says, if I profane, profane, profanity, that's an interesting word. So we'll underline that. If I profane with my unworthiest hand, this holy shrine. So he's talking about a holy shrine. He's talking about Juliet as a holy shrine. He turns her essentially into a metaphor. Now, Juliet is not a holy shrine. Why should she be? OK, this is a really important point, and we'll come back to that later. If I profane with my unworthiest hand this holy shrine, the gentle fine is this, my lips two blushing pilgrims. OK, that's an interesting term. Pilgrims, ready stand to smooth that rough touch with a tender kiss. OK, so the words we've underlined here, profane holy shrine pilgrims, they all have very specific connotations. 
So we'll just bear that in mind for now, and we'll look at what Juliet says in response. Juliet says, good pilgrim. So she picks up the vocabulary that Romeo has already used and throws it back at him. So she uses this word pilgrim. You do wrong your hand too much, which mannerly devotion shows in this. Devotion. OK, let's underline that. The saints have hands that pilgrim, again, hands do touch, and palm to palm is holy palmer's kiss. OK, so we've got all the words that I'm underlining here, you'll notice, have religious connotations. They are specifically um, words associated with Catholicism. OK, Shri holy shrines, pilgrims, uh, devotion, holy palmers, saints specifically, um, prayer, um, saints again, um, despair and faith um, and granting prayer and prayers affect. OK, so these characters are essentially flirting. But instead of just saying, hi, my name's Romeo, hi, my name's Juliet, and I really like you, um, they talk through this massive conceit, and their conceit is um, the language of religion, the language of prayer, um, specifically. Now, this is Shakespeare telling us that these two characters... No other characters in the play talk like this. So this is Shakespeare telling us, telling you, the audience, through language, through a specific conceit, that these characters are immediately able to connect with one another. Because Romeo starts... He thinks he's being really clever. If I profane with my unworthiest hand, he thinks he's being sort of really complimentary and clever. But Juliet is able to turn that conceit... Um, and use it to her benefit as well. She extends it. So they end up with this rather long exchange, this long conversation, and it finishes with Romeo actually stealing a kiss from Juliet. And it's very clever. You think just, just from the vocabulary that Shakespeare's achieved all of this um, there. Now, so we thought about the vocabulary for a bit, but I just want to, to go on to structure and sort of the, the, the ability to identify um, verse... Um, here in, in, in an exchange like this. But to do that, we're just going to shift over and have a think about, about poetry. Um, very briefly. Over here. So here I've got um, sonnet 18. So for those of you that have printouts, you can have a look at the, the sonnet. And it begins, shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Now, as I said, this is sonnet 18, so Shakespeare wrote it. And we're looking at this in relation to that extract from Romeo and Juliet that we were thinking about earlier. Um, now, Shakespeare begins it, shall I compare thee to a summer's day? And that's a very important question. OK, it's a question in a poem, but the question relates to um, the fact that a sonnet is really a form of poetry that's designed to flatter, to praise the object of the sonneteer or the poet's affection. Now, the sonnet itself originated in the 14th century with an Italian poet called Petrarch. And Petrarch uh, was a priest, funnily enough, and he fell in love um, with a girl called Laura, with a woman, I should say, called Laura. And he'd only met... We don't know how often he met her. There's no evidence that he ever actually spoke to her. But after having seen Laura, Petrarch wrote hundreds and hundreds of sonnets praising the beauty of Laura, of this woman, of this crucially unattainable woman, this woman that he can't have. So the idea of a sonnet being a, a poem of praise to the lover really comes from there, this business about um, the object of your, of your affection being completely unattainable, which is why Shakespeare compares the object of his affection in this instance to a summer's day. Because you can't put a summer's day in a little box with a bow on and keep it um, in the same way that Petrarch could never have Laura, in the same way that Shakespeare can't have the object of his affection in this instance. So initially a sonnet is a poem of praise about something or someone that you can't have. But the point of the sonnet is that you're praising that person, you're adoring it, uh, or him or her, and comparing that person to something that you can't have, something beyond human attainment, like a summer's day. But in this case, Shakespeare is, is saying that the object of his affection is more is more lovely than a summer's day, is much better. And then he uses all this kind of language, these hyperboles, um, to do with nature, to compare and contrast his lover, the object of his affection, to um, nature itself. So that's really what a sonnet is and what this kind of love, typical kind of love poem 
is supposed to do. But let's think about this in terms of its structure, OK? If we think about its um, rhyme, I'm sure you've looked at sonnets before, but we're just going to go through this um, to have a think more, more clearly. So we'll think about the rhyme, and we've got shall I compare thee to a summer's day. So that ends with uh, day, which we'll call rhyme A, more temperate, which we'll call B, buds of May, back to A, date, B, shines, A, um, dimmed, um, rhymes with um, B, A, B, oh, sorry, shines, we've got C, shines, dimmed, D, decline, C, D, so we've got A, B, A, B, C, D, C, D, E, F, shade, rhymes with fade, E, F, G, G. So we've got this nice rhyming couplet at the end here of this sonnet, and that's really what distinguishes an English sonnet, or what we call a Shakespearean sonnet, um, from other Italian forms, um, because it rhymes in this nice um, couplet here. Now, another fundamental uh, point about the, the sonnet is that it's written in a very specific metre, and that metre is what we call the iambic pentameter. Now, that is very simple to understand. An iam is a metric foot made up of two syllables, an unstressed syllable followed by a stressed syllable. So it sounds like a heartbeat, like a didum. You can tap it out on your feet or clap it with your hands. So in this sonnet, we have the iambic pentameter. We have a didum in the word shall I. So we've got a shall I, OK? A didum. Compare thee, compare thee to a sir. Must day. OK, so that's really what I am means. And the pentameter refers to the fact that we've got five I ams. Shall I compare the two a sir must... But there's my bad squiggle. A sir must day. So we've got five feet, five I ams in a line. Now, if we go back to Romeo and Juliet, we will notice that the exact same thing is happening here. We've got the same sonnet rhyme scheme. Um, a, B, A, B, C, D, C, D, E, F, E, F, G, G. Those nice rhyming couplets at the end. And we also have that nice consistent iambic pentameter. If I profane with my unworthiest hand. OK, so we've got a consistent metre and we've got the rhyme scheme of a sonnet. So this is Shakespeare using verse to mirror, to echo that very typical expression of love, the sonnet. Only these two lovers are sharing it. They're using um, their knowledge of language and lovemaking on the stage and in kind of literary contexts, in kind of theatrical contexts, very, very clearly, um, very deliberately to evoke that sonnet form. Now, the actual no, being able to recognise metre and, and rhyme is very, very important because it tells us quite a lot about character. So very quickly, I'd just like to show you the example of Olivia from Twelfth Night, which is another comedy. Now, this is a very, very, really, really handy technique to keep in mind when you're thinking about characters, because Shakespeare uses verse and, of course, language to signal shifts in characters' behaviour and attitude. Now, Olivia has just fallen in love with um, a serving boy. Um, now, the serving boy is called Cesario, who the audience actually knows is a woman dressed up. It's a woman called Viola dressed up as a boy called Cesario. But that's by the by. Olivia's decided that she's kind of fallen for this chap called Cesario. Um, and she says, um, Thy tongue, thy face, thy limbs, actions and spirit do give thee fivefold blazon. OK, so she's using those big hyperboles, hyperboles that we talked about um, in the sonnet and those being really important, kind of comparing um, your love to something unattainable, to something really big, something of magnitude. And then she says, not too fast, soft, soft. So she's slowing herself down. She's becoming very, very conscious. Unless the master were the man, how now? Now just think about that, how that falls on your ear. Unless the master were the man, how now? What she's doing is falling into iambic pentameter because the iambic pentameter mirrors the sound of the heartbeat. So the audience knows just because Olivia has all of a sudden began, begun to talk in metre. She hasn't done that before. She's talking here, thy tongue, thy face, thy limbs, action and spirit to give thee fivefold blazon, not too fast, soft, soft. There isn't a consistent metre there, OK? There isn't at all. And then she starts to talk 
in this heartbeat. So you get this sense that her heart's beating faster and faster because she's really fallen in love. Even so quickly may one catch the plague. Methinks I feel this youth's perfections with an invisible and subtle stealth to creep in at my eyes. Well, let it be. Well, let it be. OK, so she's still falling into that meter. And then she does something else. I do I know not what and fear to find, mine eye too great a flatterer for my mind. All of a sudden, Olivia is speaking in verse, in rhyme. Look at these rhyming couplets here. And this is Shakespeare showing us that this character has gone from a state of confusion, a kind of, of, kind of not knowing exactly what's happening. And throughout this one speech, this single speech, She's fallen in love and she's demonstrating the fact that she's fallen in love through that consistency of metre and be because she started to use rhyme and very, very effectively too, very cleverly. Fate show thy force, ourselves we do not owe. What is decreed must be and be this so. It's a beautiful um, rhyming couplet in iambic pentameter and this is Shakespeare showing us that his character has completely shifted moods, has completely changed. And very quickly, before I go on to, the, to take your questions, I just want to make you aware that it's very often the case that Shakespeare um, writes what we call insincere verse. Shakespeare likes to mock bad poetry. In fact, there's nothing he hates more than bad poetry. And in the comedy Love's Labour's Lost, he starts to mimic this very bad, bad poetry. And he does that um, by using what we call kind of obvious rhymes, OK? Um, so if you look at this extract from Love Labour's Loss, which begins on a day, alack the day, love whose month is ever May, spied a blossom passing fair, playing in the wanton air. So if we think about that metre, those are not iams, which is fine, there are plenty of different um, forms. These are actually what we call trochees, it's an iam reversed. So instead of being de dum, it goes dum d. And we've got three uh, uh, trochees, on a day, alack the day, and then an extra syllable at the end, OK? Um, but it sounds really sort of quite childish. dum de dum de dum de tum tum de tum de tum de tum You can see how that immediately sounds very different to the iambic pentameter. The de tum de tum de tum de tum de tum rather than tum de tum de tum de tum It's very, very different. It's got a sort of different different feel to it. And if you look at, at the way this, this verse is laid out, we've got these very trite, very obvious rhymes. Day, may, fair, air, wind, Finned, it's, it's what we call a kind of contrived rhyme here. Death, breath, blow, so, sworn, thorn, unmeet, sweet. So it's always important to remember and to, to use Shakespeare's language as a way of, of, of understanding what it is that he's trying to say, what kind of tone is he setting. Um, in this instance, he's trying to make his audience laugh. His audience would have been aware that this character who is reciting this is utterly ridiculous. This poem is nonsense. It's really, it's quite badly written and it's really got, it's got lots of obvious rhyme. It's kind of trying too hard in many ways. So the point of all this is to take us back um, to this image here, this theatre, and to know um, that Shakespeare was writing everything, his plays, his stories, his characters, every bit of his language and his verse for the stage, for the theatre, so that he could fill that, that space with words because that's, that's what he had um, at his disposal. Those are the props that he had, those are the costumes, the words. And technically, if you close your eyes and go to a production of Shakespeare, you should still know exactly what's happening because Shakespeare gives you all of the language and all of those shifts, those tonal shifts, and all of the instructions that you need um, to tell you where you are and when, when it's happening and what's happening at the same time. So what I'm going to do now is sort of hand over to you in a way and invite you um, to ask your questions. So have we had any questions um, come into us so far? We have. OK, so here is a question. Um, why is it still important to study Shakespeare and his works? That's a very, very interesting and a very relevant question. You know, we've been studying Shakespeare for hundreds of years. So why is it still important to do so? 
While Shakespeare was writing during the Renaissance, a period of great intellectual kind of liberty, and his his works have, have almost, I know this phrase is quite cliche, but stood the test of time, and they're still relevant and important to study um, for, for a few key reasons. First of all, the intellectual liberty that came around at this point meant that Shakespeare could really be asking questions that are universal, and there's a nice word to use in, in your exams or your coursework, universal, because Shakespeare's plays, his characters, his stories and the questions that they ask themselves are relevant to everybody, no matter where you're from. So that's part of the reason he was coming from this period when they were asking huge questions, like Hamlet asks himself, um, to be or not to be? I mean, what's more fundamental than the question of existence, you know? What, what, what does it mean to be alive? What is a man if his chief good and profit of his time be but to sleep and feed? You know, he's got these great questions. And the characters uh, themselves are, you know, you can relate to all of them. So the stories are important, and the stories are still being appropriated now. I mean, you just think about how popular Romeo and Juliet is and how many times it's been retold. And the story of Hamlet has been reappropriated or reworked so that if when you watch um, something like The Lion King, for instance, the great Disney classic, it's actually the story of a prince trying to get vengeance against his uncle for having murdered his father. It's the story of Hamlet. Um, so the stories are still relevant and people are still working through them today. Day. And another reason um, why Shakespeare is still studied is because Shakespeare himself was the great contributor to the English language. He coined so many phrases that we take for granted and, and that are in sort of common usage. So things like barefaced, um, the long and short of it, the crack of doom, all these things first appear in Shakespeare's works. And I'm sure that you use Shakespeare's language more often um, than you're aware every day because he coined hundreds of terms and phrases. And of course, lots of insults too. We can't forget those insults. They're very, very famous. But Shakespeare is so important to study because he is a huge part of our legacy as a nation. And perhaps there's no better time to talk about that than on St George's Day, um, the kind of patron saint of England and the saint that Shakespeare talks about often as well, and particularly in, in history plays. Are there any other... Oh, we've got lots of questions. What is your favourite Shakespeare play and why? Oh, that's such a hard question. People often ask me that. Um, I, I'm going to be diplomatic here and say I don't have a favourite, but I have a few that I like a little more than others. So my favourites would have to be um, King Lear, Measure for Measure, and Hamlet. Um, for those of you that don't know those plays, um, all three of them are full of trouble and woe, and people make, sort of asking very, very difficult, difficult questions. So King Lear, for instance, is about um, the human condition and why, why is man so kind of fundamentally... Um, sort of fallible, I suppose. And the same thing with Measure for Measure, in a way, even though it was originally written as a comedy, it became known in the 19th century as a problem play because it asks too many difficult questions. Like, what do you do? What do you do um, when you don't feel that justice is something that's ever achievable? Can you ever um, achieve a state, a status in which um, everybody, everybody gets their just desserts. It's a really, really important uh, question. And Shakespeare asks it so effectively in that play of Measure for Measure. And of course, everybody loves Hamlet. He's just, he's is a, a fascinating character. And Hamlet's such a skillfully um, written piece of drama as well. So those have to be my three um, favourites, I suppose, if I had to choose. But they're all great. All the plays, the whole canon is wonderful. The histories, the tragedies and the comedies. I, I love them all. I don't know why you wouldn't love them. Um, I'll just move on to another question. What tips can you give for people who want to learn more about Shakespeare but to, who struggle to understand the language? Oh, that's a very good question. So what do you do if you want to learn more about Shakespeare but struggle to understand the language? Well, as I said, the language is key and it can feel a little bit 
it can feel a bit tricky and perhaps sometimes flouncy as well, a bit of a barrier to overcome to understand Shakespeare. But I think the best way to overcome that, if you want to, um, and if you, if you can have the means to, go to a theatre and watch a production because the language really comes to life. And even if you don't follow every single thing or every single word or exchange on the stage, you can still get a sense of what's happening and how those words are expressed and delivered on a stage might even help you to understand what in fact is being said. Or failing that, if you can't get to a theatre, then buy or watch or rent a film. There are so many film adaptations of Shakespeare and some of them are absolutely incredible. And see it, see those words in action, see what's happening. Um, alternatively, you could also, you could just sit down with a text and sort of, and read it and sort of workshop it very slowly and sort of, and see if you get the gist of what's going on. Or of course, if you watch a film version or a stage version, you could watch it along with your text and follow it um, as well, almost like subtitles in a way and see if that helps you get to grips with what's going on with the plot. Perhaps you could read a plot summary before if you're confused about what's happening um, and then you can think about getting getting closer to the language but the best way of overcoming that difficulty um, is to really hear those words um, being spoken as they were intended um, when, when Shakespeare wrote them, he wrote them for the stage. So get off to a theatre and go and see them. Go and hear those words as Shakespeare intended you to hear them. And one last question. Why is Shakespeare so much more famous than other writers of his time? That is a brilliant question. Um, well, one of the reasons for that is obviously the fact that Shakespeare coined lots of terms. So he has obviously um, kind of got more currency with the language and with the way in which we study him now. But the other reason is that, um, and this is a really fundamental reason, the other reason is that his works were published in one place in 1623. Um, we're very, very lucky to be able to have all of his plays. Most, many of the other playwright. So Ben Jonson, for instance, also published his, his sort of complete works or many of his collected works um, a little before Shakespeare's were published posthumously, so after his death. Um, so we also have lots of Johnson's works and Marlowe's works, but a lot of playwrights only publish their plays sort of on an individual basis rather than as, as kind of collected. Um, Shakespeare's um, sort of friends and actors brought together all of his plays, 36 plays in fact, though we think he wrote around 38, We've, we can attribute 38 plays to him, but 36, that's an awful lot of, of text, uh, were published in what we call the first folio in 1623. And because we have that text, each one of those plays has survived and it makes it much easier um, to access Shakespeare um, than other playwrights from the period. Though we have their plays, Shakespeare's plays are in one place, they exist in a complete works, which even today is being republished, re-edited, um, reworked, um, because it's so fundamentally significant as a collection of, of texts. And of course, we have rather a lot more, contrary to popular belief, we have rather a lot more information about William Shakespeare than we do any other playwright from this period, for instance. So we know rather a lot more about Shakespeare than we do about Christopher Marlowe, who was born in the exact same year as William Shakespeare too. And for more information, um, you can always go to the Shakespeare Birthplace Trust website, um, which tells you a lot about, about Shakespeare's history, and you can learn about um, the documents that we have that survived, that he signed, for instance, and the information that we have um, left about him. So I hope that's answered all of your questions for today. Um, I hope that you've enjoyed the session and please um, do read Shakespeare, keep studying it and really celebrate him today. It is his birthday and he would have absolutely loved to know that you are all out there reading and engaging with his language, which is very, very special indeed. Thank you very much for tuning in um, and I hope that you enjoy studying Shakespeare. Goodbye.